things you're talking about in Billings is what you're calling the global gun grab. That, that would be news to most people, and it is to me, too. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's that all about? I attended last July's small arms conference at UN headquarters, and that was the first time that the United Nations had ever overtly called for global regulation of the civilian possession of firearms. And the consensus achieved last July at that meeting called for international regulation of firearms possession by non-state actors, meaning with a special emphasis and a special focus on the gun-owning population in the United States, which was identified to that kind to world peace. <laughs> Why the United States? Because we're the, the biggest nation of exactly. individual gun owners or something like that? Biggest and most powerful nation and the most armed in terms of the sheer numbers of people who possess firearms. Arguably, the rate of firearms ownership is higher in Switzerland, but there are more gun owners among the civilian population in the United States than in any other country. One of the figures I heard at this conference was that there are something on the order of 400 million firearms in private circulation here in the United States, and that this quantity exceeds the total amount of what all the world's armies and all the world's police agencies combined. And so in terms of raw numbers, if not in terms of skill, it could be said that the American gun-owning population outguns the rest of the world, which is why the United Nations is focusing on the supposed need to bring about the incremental disarmament of the American public. Incremental, public. Not, not instant No, that will not happen. Okay. Exactly. That will not happen instantaneously. Can happen, even if they wanted to? Exactly. At, at present, uh, the United Nations doesn't have the power or the means to go about confiscating firearms. But what is happening is that our own domestic institutions are being reconfigured in a way to bring about the eventual confiscation of civilian firearms or the eventual abolition of that right. In what way are they being reconfigured? The most important way comes through the consolidation of our military and police functions, which is something that the United Nations program calls for. The idea that you break down the walls between the military and the police to create an internal security force. And this is something that has happened, quite frankly, on an accelerated pace since September 11th. And we now have an Office of Homeland Security that disposes of some elements of our military, our National Guard. And this is something which comports with the long-term design of the United Nations to create an internal security force. One of the other things, apart from the militarization and centralization of law enforcement that the United Nations calls for, is the recognition by every central government that it has a duty to control all the firearms within its borders. Uh, Kofi Annan, the current Secretary General, back in the year 2000, put out a report in which he said that so-called illicit firearms, and by definition under the UN's uh, program, civilian-owned firearms are illicit, illicit firearms have to be brought within the control of states. And the means whereby they would do this would be various initiatives. You'd start with such things as gun buyback programs, which we have had in American cities, mm -hmm. and amnesties for people who possess illegal firearms. And eventually, when necessary, uh, active measures by law enforcement officers to confiscate illegal firearms. In the city of Chicago right now, you have a group called CAGE, which is the Chicago Gun Enforcement Chicago Anti-Gun uh, Enforcement Agency, uh, which is entrusted with the duty of going around literally confiscating firearms in compliance with that city's draconian gun control laws. These are the types of initiatives that fall under the rubric of what I call the global gun grab. And many people don't understand the connection with the United Nations, but it is an eternal principle, quite frankly, that in matters of disarmament, both national and individual, all roads eventually lead now, to the UN. Your organization has made the UN the, the, the uh, boogeyman for... Well, the UN More than actually, 40 years now, and it's still basically a powerless organization. Well, the UN actually has made itself a very effective bogeyman. We just try to hold up a mirror to the UN to let people know what they intend oh, to right, do. Oh, right, but it still has no, no power. I mean, it, it has a great deal more power than most people assume. For instance, uh, just this past April 11th, the United Nations announced that it had received the final signature, uh, not signatures, but ratifications of the International Criminal Court Treaty, which will go into effect on July 1st. That's a court which claims universal jurisdiction meaning that people who live in countries whose governments have not ratified that treaty would be subject to prosecution if they commit an act which the UN considers to be a violation of international law. The predecessor of that organization is the International War Crimes Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which is in The Hague. That's where the UN's International Criminal Court will be uh -huh. headquartered. 
In order to prosecute suspects, the United Nations, acting with its allies and with compliant national authorities, has actually kidnapped people to put them on trial. Former political leaders, unsavory people like Slobodan Milosevic, for whom I bear no brief, obviously, right. uh, literally was kidnapped under pressure from the United States directed at uh, the former Yugoslavia in order to deliver him to The Hague. There also is a movement afoot to extradite the current president of uh, Serbia, uh, oh. to stand trial before the International Tribunal for The Hague. That's another really interesting precedent. As that applies to Americans, the most troublesome precedent involves a Rwandan pastor by the name of Elizifan Intakarunamata. He was living in Houston, Texas in 1996. Uh, he fled from Rwanda during the horrible genocide that ensued in 1994. The United Nations demanded that he be extradited from this country. The FBI our FBI, acting on orders from the United Nations, arrested him and detained him for the purpose of extradition. It took about a year and a half or so to work out the legal machinery for extraditing him to a UN court in Tanzania because there was no existing extradition treaty. And finally, the Clinton administration was able to find a federal judge that would sign off on the illegal extradition of this American resident to stand trial for things he had supposedly done in Rwanda. That's important because a legal resident alien in our country, somebody who comes here in compliance with our immigration laws, enjoys the same procedural rights and immunities as an American citizen. So you have a precedent here under which an American citizen could face UN justice be extradited by our country in compliance with UN treaties Back and conventions. Up a minute. You said the FBI acting under UN yes. orders. I didn't know the FBI ever acted under UN orders. The FBI not only acted under UN orders to arrest Pastor and Takarutamada, it was involved in securing the so-called crime scene in Rwanda under UN supervision. So that illustrates what I'm talking about in terms of the efforts to modify, to adulterate to subvert our own institutions yeah, you, in compliance you, with our so-called You're mind-boggling me in a minute, in a way. I, I, <clears throat> I've tended to think of the FBI as strictly a domestic organization. You know, it's it doesn't go overseas. Assumed, I mean, if, there, if there's something happening overseas, that would be the CIA's responsibility, yeah, it, It's right? assumed a much higher profile in matters of international organized crime since 1994. Uh, on July 4th of 1994, former FBI Director Louis Free went to Moscow to sign an agreement with the Federal Security Service, the FSB, uh -huh. in Russia, under which the United States FBI would plant an office in Moscow and send agents throughout the countryside. And the FSB, which is the renamed KGB, would send officers to the United States to train in, at Quantico, Virginia, at the FBI's academy. <laughs> and since that time, the FBI has opened offices in Hungary and in Beijing and elsewhere in the world. They become, they're becoming really, quite frankly, the GBI, the Global Bureau of Investigation, rather than the FBI. Which All is, right, but if a, if, a, if a UN person gives them an order, how can they follow that? Can't they just say, hey, I take my orders from the president I would the hope Congress they would. or something like that? <laughs> I, right. I hope they would say that their chain of command doesn't terminate with the United Nations Secretary General, but with respect to the FBI and unfortunately with respect to our own military, there are many circumstances in which the UN has operational command over American law enforcement and military personnel because we are giving that command to them, not because they're taking it by force, uh -huh. but because of actions undertaken by our own leaders that are delivering these elements of our government over to the operational control of the UN. Is there a timetable for this global gun grab? I don't think there is a, a firm I mean, When When could it likely happen? I mean, that sounds like such a slow process, it wouldn't occur during our lifetime. It may or it may doing not. It incrementally. I think one of the things that is happening is that abroad, where the United Nations has the, the means and the opportunity, it actively and aggressively seeks to disarm civilian populations. That took place in Haiti, for instance, in the early 1990s. And it was American military personnel who were given the assignment of going door to door with gun registration lists to seize firearms from Haitian civilians. It's happened in El Salvador, it's happened in Guatemala. There are active measures un underway right now in Costa Rica. In the Balkans, in Kosovo in particular, you've had another circumstance in which American military personnel have been used to go out and collect weapons from uh, civilians, but primarily the Serb civilians who remain in Kosovo, most of them have been chased out. Uh. But there are many instances, once again, around the world where when given the opportunity, the UN will go about aggressively collecting firearms through amnesties, through gun buybacks, and where necessary, by full force raids. So it's something which is underway elsewhere, but it's something that has not yet had a visible or palpable impact on our own circumstances here in the United States. But if present trends continue, it eventually will. Get really basic. What's wrong with having an unarmed population?
An unarmed population is prey to criminals, not only in the private sphere, but in the public sphere. You have a circumstance where citizens are, are disarmed, mm -hmm. that criminals enjoy a competitive advantage, and one of the results is that you always have a sharp spike in gun-related crime. That's what's happening right now in England. They outlawed handguns in 1997. Since that time, they have had an escalating uh, campaign of armed crime as criminals enjoying their advantage have been preying upon the disarmed civilian population in Great Britain. That's one problem. The larger problem, however, is that if a government itself becomes corrupt, mm -hmm. if a government itself becomes a criminal syndicate, an unarmed population becomes fodder for genocide. That's happened in the former Soviet Union, that happened in Nazi Germany, it happened in Cambodia, and it happened in 1994 in Rwanda under the very eyes of a UN peacekeeping force. So there's sort of a two-pronged problem here. You become vulnerable to criminals in both the public and in the private sphere. <clears throat> and the disarmament of law-abiding civilians historically has been an indispensable precursor for genocide or other forms of political mass murder. One of the things I like to say is that um, St. Augustine, in his work, The City of God, pointed out that justice being taken away, what are kingdoms but vast robberies? A, a government that's not committed to protecting the rights of the governed is a criminal syndicate. But it differs from private criminal syndicates in one key point, and that is that governments, as criminal syndicates, are much, much better at mass murder than their private sector competition. As I, I like to say that mass murder is the only area of human existence. In human which effort, government is more efficient in than the private sector? In which government outperforms its private sector competition. <laughs> Very good point. I have the impression that British police are unarmed a lot of the time. They're not Am anymore. Right? They're not anymore? No. Is that, that was that true? That was we used true. to hear about their pride in having their bobbies yeah, who didn't carry yeah, guns Bobby, and things Bobby like that. The bobbies, named after Robert Peel, who organized the, the British police uh, agencies, yeah. uh, they didn't need to use guns, and uh, historically they had taken great pride in the fact that England was supposedly more civilized and you could resolve matters without the resort to armed force on the part of uh, agents of the state. However, in recent years, this is something that was documented in the April 30th Los Angeles Times. Subsequent to the outlawing of the possession of handguns by the British uh, public, you've had this sharp spike in armed violence on the part of street gangs and private criminals in Great Britain, mm -hmm. and now the Bobbies are becoming a paramilitary organization. They're using high caliber weapons, uh, they're wearing body armor, they're using APCs, they're becoming militarized, and that's a predictable coefficient of civilian disarmament. Alexander Hamilton in the 29th Federalist Paper pointed out that the only real alternative to having a standing army of occupation in order to maintain public order is an armed civilian population. And it's much more desirable because not only does it have the effect of deterring crime, it has the effect of deterring criminal ambitions on the part of corrupt government officials. So that's really the set of alternatives we have. We can have an armed population, an armed civilian population, law-abiding, conscientious people, or eventually we can have a police state. And in Great Britain and a couple of other places in Europe that historically have not had as much violent crime as we, we're finding that they're getting the worst of both worlds. A high rate of violent, gri violent crime and also the militarization of their police. Obviously you're a